Listen only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm uh, Ken Clairboat, K4ZW, on behalf of the Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar presentation. Uh, as you know, we will take questions uh, at the end of the presentation, but uh, feel free to drop those to us at any point. And uh, tonight, uh, of course, we have a familiar face with us, uh, Carl Lutzel Schwab, K9 LA. Um, I wanted to tell a quick story here. Uh, when Carl had proposed this uh, topic, um, I said, yeah, great, that, that sounds interesting. Uh, being a low band guy myself, I thought uh, this would be good. But Carl said, I don't know that we'll have a lot of people attend. It's, uh, maybe it won't draw a big crowd, but fine, let's, let's just do it. Well, to give you a, an idea of the, uh, the reach of this uh, program, as I logged on tonight to get things set up, we had uh, 225 people uh, registered for this, uh, which is just uh, fantastic. And we do get a lot of hits on the uh, recorded the recordings uh, which we post on the uh, WWROF uh, webpage at a later date. So just to give you an idea of uh, crowd size, uh, now that doesn't mean everyone will uh, attend tonight, but uh, that's a pretty good uh, number for registration. So enough of me. With that, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Carl in Indiana, and uh, um, you can have it at Carl. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Ken, and uh, just welcome to everyone who uh, registered and showed up tonight. I know there's lots of other things going on in the world that... Uh, take, uh, you know, grab your time, but uh, thank you for showing up. And as you can see, what we're going to talk about is uh, gray line propagation on the low bands. Uh, and as Ken earlier mentioned, well, I was a little hesitant to do this, didn't know what the uh, interest would be, but uh, well, we'll find out, I guess. It could be that what I present has nothing to do with what we thought I was going to present, so <laughs> we'll just try it and see. First, uh, thanks to the uh, uh, Worldwide Radio Operators Foundation for putting on these webinars. Really appreciate lots of good ones. Uh, there's another one coming up. Uh, I believe it's next week. Ken will probably mention it at the end here too. So, so what we're going to talk about is uh, uh, mostly gray line propagation type stuff. Uh, what I'll start out with though is the quick status of cycle 24 because I think something pretty interesting, uh, some interesting data has been updated and. And I think it's kind of interesting, so uh, we'll just get through it. It's only about three or four slides. Then we'll get into the uh, the meat of the uh, presentation tonight. You know, where where did gray lines start? Uh, I think there's some confusion uh, on uh, what is gray line. Then we'll go over the common explanation for it. But then we'll talk about uh, some of the doubts that crept into my mind uh, over the over the years and. Uh, uh, made me think. Well, maybe maybe what everybody says about gray line isn't really true. And we'll talk a little bit about the ionization process. That's where uh, some of the physics gets in here, and what I think is really happening. So let's uh, get started with uh, cycle 24. That's just a picture of where we are right now. The uh, the blue vertical bars are the monthly mean 10.7 uh, centimeters solar flux values. In other words, you know, take every all the daily values in a month and average them, and that's a monthly mean. The red line is the smoothed. Okay, you, as you can see, the latest monthly data is for uh, August uh, 20, 2014, which just ended, and that says that the latest smooth is for February 2014. And as you can see, we're in the second peak of cycle 24. It's higher than the first one, and I think the biggest takeaway uh, for that is that. Uh, I think the higher bands this fall and winter are going to be uh, at least as good as they were last fall and winter, which was pretty darn good. So uh, take advantage of what cycle 24 is giving us and uh, uh, just have a lot of fun. That's what it's all about. Now the latest data that I refer to is uh, about uh, disappearing sunspots. Um, I had a, a webinar uh, here with WWROF. Uh, on the Maunder minimum issues. That was back in April. And I presented uh, some original data that came from uh, two solar scientists named Livingston and Penn. And they had data through, uh, well, it looks like 2008, 2009 or so, yeah, 2009 February. And what it showed was the strength of the magnetic field around sunspots has been decreasing since they started measuring it in, uh, I think it was 92. And their uh, 
main point was that when the magnetic strength gets below about 1500 gauss, we won't be able to see the sunspots. So that's uh, pretty interesting and uh, the plot on the right was just an update uh, through the end of 2013. And what it shows is that, well, it looks like that decline uh, has started to slow down. Um, so if we go to the next plot, here's the data through September uh, 2014, I believe. And indeed, it's leveled off. Um, and uh, maybe it's going to start going up or stay flat, who knows. Uh, what, what it really suggests is maybe we're not headed for a Maunder type minimum. Uh, you know, the Maunder minimum was when uh, there were no sunspots. And maybe uh, this suggests we're still going to see sunspots, we're still going to count them. And of course, that translates into 10.7 centimeter solar flux, etc. And what I think may just happen is we'll just uh, enter a period of low or small sunspot cycles. You can see that uh, history has uh, given us three periods of maximum sunspot cycles and two periods of lower sunspot cycles. And it looks like we're headed for a, a period of low sunspot cycles. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll still see lots of sunspots, but not as many, of course, as uh, what most of us have seen in our lifetime. But there'll be some, and that'll give us propagation on the higher bands to a certain degree. We'll just have to wait and see how... Uh, how these next so several cycles come out. Okay, let's get back to uh, gray line stuff. <clears throat> now, the first uh, known mention of gray line that I'm aware of was an article in uh, 1975 CQ magazine by K6QA, uh, W6NLZ, and K6SSS. And what they talked about is mostly working Europe, Africa, and the Mideast via long path on 80 meter sideband. Uh, and mostly, uh, well, this was done at uh, sunrise and also sunset. And from the article, uh, I quote uh, that uh, they define uh, gray line as long path, a long path opening that exists between two points on the Earth which are experiencing simultaneous sunrise and sunset. And I think it's a, that's an excellent uh, definition of gray line. When you think about it and uh, even look at a map, as we'll do a little bit later. On the right, there's the uh, first page of the CQ article. So here's an example. Uh, W6NLZ worked uh, Market Reef, OJ0, in January of 74. He did it at his sunrise. Of course, that was the uh, OJ0 sunset. And the path, the long path, uh, uh, went uh, allegedly went over Antarctica. Uh, and up across uh, Eastern Africa and the Mideast, and then finally got into uh, Market Reef. Now in green there, there's another quote from the article. It's like, signals travel along the edge of the band or ring of twilight encircling the Earth. In other words, the signal follows the uh, terminator. And that's where I think there's a problem. Now, before we get into why I think that's a problem, let's uh, get some definitions straight. Uh, sometimes I've seen the term gray line used for a sunrise sunset enhancement path. Uh, what I believe gray line should be defined as is it follows the terminator. Uh, whereas a sunrise sunset enhancement is on a path going away from the terminator. Perpendicular is best. Uh, for example, uh, that's a map from W6EL prop. It shows a path from my location, P9LA, to ST0RY uh, uh, in, in March of 2003, that the expedition there, at 0330. Uh, and uh, from about 0320 to 0340, the signal came up significantly at my QTH. And that's more of a uh, uh, sunrise sunset enhancement. And, and not what I define as gray line. Now that sunrise sunset enhancement is uh, believed to be due to ducting in the electron density valley above the E region peak in the dark ionosphere. Uh, ray traces show it and I think there's ample evidence that uh, we can pretty much be assured that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the sunrise or sunset enhancement is kind of due to ducting. 
well, maybe there's something else going on in the dark ionosphere, but uh, I think the ducting is the best explanation we have right now. So here's a comparison of gray line and not gray line. Uh, so at least we're uh, we're going to be all be on the same page here for about an hour on, on uh, what gray line means. What gray line means it looks like it follows the terminator. Of course, the explanation of gray line is rooted in the concept that before sunrise, the F2 region is formed prior to the D region. Similarly, uh, after sunset, uh, the D region goes away prior to the F region, F2 region going away. Thus, there's a band along the terminator of F region ionization without D region ionization. Okay, that's what the, uh, the current explanation of gray line is. It's interesting that uh, the E region isn't discussed, but uh, well, so be it. So how does that happen? Well, it's pretty easy if you just draw a little uh, simple figure here and use some spher spherical geometry. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the sun illuminates that ground sunrise point, that orangish star, but the uh, radiation solar, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the radiation from the sun passes or grazes the ground at ground sunrise and keeps going to uh, a location further away. And I just uh, called it my location there, the blue star. And you can see that uh, it illuminates the uh, F2 region at a higher height. So if we go through and just do some calculations, uh, the top image there on the right is uh, uh, for when uh, I am about 69 minutes before uh, my ground sunrise. You know, ground sunrise is further to the east. Uh, it says the F2 region is eliminated at 300 kilometers. Okay, so the middle figure is uh, looking at the D region. Uh, it's illuminated over my location about 35 minutes before my ground sunrise. And of course at ground sunrise, uh, that's a pretty simple picture there on the bottom. So what it all comes down to is uh, it sure adds up to, uh, you know, the, the terminator is a band that the F2 region isn't illuminated, it isn't ionized, but uh, is ionized, but the D region isn't. And that's, uh, like I said, essentially what happens. Uh, uh, that, that's the current explanation for gray line. But as you can see by that last bullet, uh, over the years, several doubts have crept in. Uh, and, and I've kind of thought about them more and more. Uh, doubt number one was uh, back in 2002, and probably even earlier if I would have recognized it, but I worked YB1A on uh, 40 meters CW on a December uh, evening around my sunset. And he had a pretty darn good signal about S8, which uh, uh, I've calibrated my S meter. That's about set minus 78 dBm. And I was using an inverted V at the time, and of course I couldn't tell if it was long path, short path, or anything else. Uh, most experienced DXers would say it was long path. And uh, you can see there's some headings, and I used VOACAP to come up with uh, what it predicted. Now, long path is predicted to be at minus 180 dBm, and that's pretty darn low. In fact, it's uh, something like 50 dB below the noise floor of our modern receivers. Short path, mm, it's a lot better. And it's predicted to be right about at the uh, noise floor of our receivers. So how in the heck did uh, YB1A come in at uh, minus 78, 78 dBm when our models of the ionosphere predict a heck of a uh, lot less signal? And even if we assumed it was short path, the difference between minus 78, what I saw, and minus 130 is about 52 dB. So is our model the ionosphere off that much? There's another doubt that uh, crept in, and uh, this happened uh, in 2005. I posted a message to the top end reflector uh, about uh, the F2 region forming before the D region, and I got a really good response from Mike, K1MK, uh, and you can see what he said. Uh, While illumination by visible light to which the atmosphere is transparent will start prior to ground level sunrise and continue after ground level sunset, 
direct solar ionizing flux would be expected to appear and disappear at all altitudes simultaneously with ground level sunrise sunset. Now you got to think about that for a while, but uh, the key point is uh, illumination by visible light. So let's look into that a little bit later here. Doubt number three was uh, one of the major D expeditions, 3Y0X. That was back in February 2006. Um, <clears throat> what's shown uh, is uh, uh, on the left is uh, the time when they first started working uh, U.S. stations, about 0210 UTC. You can see that uh, uh, the signal gets away from the terminator, and they work signals, uh, work U.S. stations all the way up to 0901 UTC, which uh, uh, again the path is away from the terminator. And they worked about 764 U.S. stations, so you know, there, there was quite a bit, and uh, most of it happened in the dark ionosphere. Now, if we look at uh, uh, path JA. They had an excellent gray line opening via short path uh, around uh, 0819 UTC. Of course, IONCAP says the MUF is okay, but the absorption is prohibitive, and you know it's kind of like my YB1AQ cell. So. Uh, our model says a gray line path is not very efficient. Now, how many QSOs did they make with the JA on that uh, gray line path? One. So. Uh, you know, if gray line via long path is so efficient, why is it short path? You know, what's the difference? And and when I start thinking about that, uh, I'm not sure I've ever seen a report of a fantastic short path gray line QSO, like the 3Y0X one. Uh, every gray line QSO that I've seen on the lower bands has been via, in quotes, uh, long path. Now, G0KYA, uh, monitored to the VP8NO uh, beacon in uh, November 2002 on 40 meters, and he saw about a 3 to 6 dB average enhancement 30 minutes before mutual sunrise, but not, not when the uh, signal, or not when the terminator was along the path. Uh, so, you know, if, if you know, why, why wasn't gray line good too, or why was it even a lot better than 3 to 6 dB? So this got me wondering about is propagation along the terminator really as efficient as commonly delayed? Now a couple of comments about absorption. Uh, let me do something here first. There we go. Okay. Uh, now at HF, absorption is proportional to electron density times collision frequency. So. Uh, what we can do is kind of understand a little bit about absorption by knowing that the electron density increases as altitude increases. Now this is below the E region peak and the collision frequency below the E region peak, uh, well I actually uh, starting up at the F2 region, the collision frequency decreases, altitude increases. So there's a simple little plot of uh, both of those uh, parameters and since the uh, uh, absorption is the product of those, you would expect that uh, where they intersect is where uh, the most absorption would occur, because one's going one way, the other's going the other way. And indeed, if you follow through with this and uh, do some work with some ray tracing programs, you'll see that absorption occurs in the D region during the day, that's what we all know, but at nighttime it moves up uh, uh, into the lower E region. So. And that's because uh, the collision frequency changes at night a little bit and the electron density changes at night a little bit. So that's something important to, to realize. Oops, how come my thing didn't work here? There we go, okay. Uh, absorption does not go to zero in the dark ionosphere on 160. Uh, even though the D region goes away, uh, absorption moves up a little bit higher into the lower E region and, and there's still about 10 dB uh, of absorption per hop on 160 at night. And when you kind of play with that number, uh, you'll find out that uh, uh, a multi-hop signal on 160 can only go out to about 10,000 kilometers before it's below uh, the noise uh, on your receiver. Now, well, it's 
more than likely not the sensitivity of the receiver that's limiting you, it's the external noise, either man-made or atmospheric. And this is why uh, ducting is uh, pretty much accepted for the longer pass on 160. That's because multi-hop just can't go that far. <laughs> uh, there is a uh, an equation for absorption that is tied to the solar zenith angle, but it's a nice smooth function. and uh, I'm not sure that uh, it represents the real world around sunrise and sunset. It's more of a mathematical construct to uh, show the trends. Okay, so uh, summarizing what we've talked about a lot here, uh, is the explanation gray line propagation correct? RF follows the terminator where, where there's an advantageous band of ionization. Or is the model of the ionosphere correct? It says propagation along the terminator is not efficient. Something else is going on. So who's right? Who's wrong? And we go back to that one quote from the old CQ article. It says signals travel along the edge of the band or ring of twilight encircling the Earth. And I think that's, that's a problem. Now if we go back to uh, setting up that F2 region picture, uh, that uh, that uh, you know the F2 region is illuminated by the sun something like 69 minutes before ground sunrise. Uh, what it does, it assumes that the ionizing radiation from the sun can go through the atmosphere twice to ionize to ionize the F2 region in the dark ionosphere, and that's where the problem lies. So let's look at, at the ionization process, and it's all about energy. Uh, we're going we're gonna to focus on 30 nanometers, radiation at 30 nanometers, because that wavelength produces eh, a little bit more than 50% of the F2 region. Uh, and from Planck's law, we know that the energy of one photon at 30 nanometers is about 41 electron volts. But unfortunately, it takes about 34 electron volts to create an electron ion pair in the uh, F2 region. So what that says is one photon at 30 nanometers creates one free electron in the F2 region, and after that, its energy is too low to do any more ionization. So uh, the true ionizing radiation can't even get through the atmosphere once. And here, gray line assumes it gets through the atmosphere twice. Now, this is also why we can't measure uh, you know, the short wavelengths at ground level because the ionization process reduces the energy and there's nothing left when it gets down to the ground level. That's why you have to go to satellites to measure all that stuff. And the same kind of uh, logic applies to the D region. Uh, the D region ionizing radiation can't get through the atmosphere once. So how does it get through twice to, uh, uh, you know, ionize the D region in the dark side of the uh, sunrise, their ground sunrise. Um, as, as I said earlier, we, we uh, prior to World War II, we couldn't even measure ionizing radiation because it didn't get through the atmosphere to get to the ground level, and we had to wait for rocket flights, and eventually uh, we got satellites up there now doing that. So uh, what we can say is, yes, before sunrise is the F2 region and the D region, are illuminated by the sun, but that's by visible light. And visible light has nothing to do with the ionization process. That's because a photon of visible light is an energy only around two to three electron volts. Uh, and uh, that just doesn't do anything. Uh, that's why, in fact, that's why visible light gets through the atmosphere unimpeded. It does not do any ionization. And that's just like 10.7 centimeter solar flux. Its energy is way too low to do anything, so it can get through the atmosphere no problem. Uh, and of course, what that says is 10.7 centimeter solar flux has nothing to do with ionization either. And as we know, it's just a proxy for uh, the true ionizing radiation, which is at uh, much shorter wavelengths. So when does the F2 region really ionize? Well, I downloaded some ionosan data. Uh, this happens to be from Millstone Hill in Massachusetts. And uh, what I annotated on the plot is uh, the time uh, when the F2 layer at 300 kilometers is illuminated. That's the big black arrow. 
And then uh, I also annotated Ground Sunrise on July 15th. Uh, and you can see uh, that's the critical, fre fre critical frequency, FOF2, of the F2 region. And you can see it, uh, it, it's still going down. <laughs> Uh, when the F2 layer is illuminated at 300 kilometers and it uh, reaches a minimum and then around Grunt Sunrise it starts coming up just like K1MK said in his emails. Now if we look at some D region uh, plots we'll see the same thing. Uh, this is over Arecibo uh, from an incoherent scatter radar. It's very difficult to measure uh, the D region at night. <laughs> And coming up, uh, it's even tough with an ion assigned. You can't measure it <laughs> at all. So we have to go to incoherent scatter radar or rocket flights. And this is the results of some scatter, uh, incoherent scatter radar. And uh, if you look at that thing long enough, uh, the local sunrise is at 0602. That's the dotted horizontal line. And at 80 kilometers, which well, that's about where the D region is, you can see that uh, it starts coming up about that time. So again, the D region ionizes just around sunrise, just like uh, K1MK said. And why sunrise? Well, that's when the photons can get to the ionospheric regions without having to plow through the atmosphere twice. So here's a, a quick interim summary. Uh, I'm very confident that the explanation on gray line on the low bands is incorrect. It's uh, uh, propagation around along the terminator on the low bands is not very efficient. And, and that kind of agrees with our model and it agrees with the physics that we've looked at. And we had to understand the ionization process uh, to come to that conclusion. And what happens is the ionospheric regions begin ionizing around sunrise, uh, not way earlier. Now, of course, there's variability. Uh, there's an ozone layer in there. Uh, the ionosides do not have pencil-thin beam, pencil beams, so uh, they can receive off-zenith reflections. Uh, the day-side E-region plasma can move horizontally into the dark ionosphere via advection, and photons can scatter into the dark ionosphere. So if you, you know, try and look at uh, you know, prove it with looking at an anison data, you could have a tough time. You've got to sort out all the variables and get down to uh, one that you think is uh, truly just, uh, you know, the, the uh, true ionizing radiation and what it's doing. So, uh, what's really happening? Well, I don't think we can just say that the current explanation is incorrect. That's not enough. Uh, we really have to come up with an alternative explanation. And what it has to do is mesh uh, our observations with physics, especially the physics that we've just gone through. And of course the clue in the, is in the quote from the CQ article that was cited on slide four, and that's the quote that I think is very good. Uh, gray line is a long path opening that exists between two points on the Earth which are experiencing simultaneous sunrise and sunset. So let's look at that W6NLZ to OJ0AM map again. Okay. So what, help, what else happens when uh, W6 and OJ0 experience simultaneous sunrise and sunset? Well, uh, there's a dark ionosphere in between the two stations now. And uh, that's what we're going to look at. So what I did is, is kind of sketched out a, a path here that uh, uh, knowing that absorption on the low bands is least in the dark ionosphere, so perhaps the RF is taking a shortcut across the dark ionosphere, and that's the white path. Then you've got to remember that RF follows a great circle path unless refracted, reflected, or scattered. So that sketch is kind of really not representative because there's only really two great circle paths between uh, W6NLZ and OJ0AM, and uh, that's the red short path and that's the black long path. That's shown on the W6EL prop map. So what the solution to all this is a skewed path. Uh, you know, there, there are many observations by those with directional antennas that uh, result in the following two axioms. Uh, uh, that you listen south, southwest at your sunrise and listen south, southeast at your sunset. 
Thus, I believe the path is more uh, uh, is kind of along the terminator, but far enough away. But it's not really at right angles to the terminator. Of course, it has to be far enough away from the terminator to uh, minimize absorption, and also allow uh, the ducting mechanism is available. So, what we're going to do is look at great circle pass out of both W6NLZ and OJ0AM. And here's W6NLZ. What it shows is the dotted lines are uh, great circle packs out of uh, W6 in 10 degree increments. Okay, and then we take the uh, great circle pass out of OJ0 in 10 degree increments. And what we're looking for uh, are uh, two great circle paths, one out of w, W6NLZ and one out of OJM, OJ0AM that get away from the terminator. And we're going to use the 3Y0X as a guideline. Remember, uh, uh, when they worked the US stations, the, the path was uh, away from the terminator. And we're going to pay attention to where these two great circle paths intersect. Now, with uh, a lot of uh, overlaying maps on each other and doing some freehand drawing. Here's the, here's the big picture. What it shows is uh, uh, great circle pass out of uh, W6. Uh, the black line is the terminator. Uh, the uh, red line is the great circle path between the two stations. And what I've also drawn on there are some green paths. Okay. The one on the left coming out of W6NLZ is, the, is a great circle path out of him, gets away from the terminator, and proceeds along uh, to uh, somewhere south of uh, Australia. Now also on that path is a great circle path out of OJ0AM. It gets away from the terminator uh, uh, fast enough, apparently, staying in the dark ionosphere. And it intersects with the other great circle path, somewhere kind of southwest of uh, Australia. <clears throat> now, what we can kind of assume is uh, that uh, where those two green paths intersect, that's where uh, there's a skew point. Okay, so somehow uh, the, the great circle path out of W6 uh, gets skewed onto the path, the great circle path that goes into OJ0. And uh, that's not too hard to believe because uh, there are ionospheric origins for skew points. Well, the normal ionosphere, it could be the E region or the F2 region. A uh, good example is FT5ZM on 10 meters. Uh, there was some uh, skewed paths reported on that from stations uh, uh, in Colorado and also in uh, Florida. And I wrote about that in uh, my practical propagation column in CQ Plus for in July 2014. It's pretty interesting. Uh, skew pass can also happen because of electron precipitation uh, due to the auroral oval. There was a real good example of that uh, when W4ZV uh, worked SM4CN on 160. Uh, but uh, W4ZV was receiving him more on an easterly heading. And it probably had something to do with the auroral oval because uh, the K index was a little bit increased. There's also a, a, a trough uh, just equatorward of the uh, auroral zone uh, where the F2 region uh, takes a dip in electron density. So there's a gradient there that could uh, do some stuff. And uh, there's a referenced article that talks about what happens there when signals go through the trough. Also, uh, another interesting scatter mechanism or a skew mechanism could be C-scatter. Uh, there was a really interesting article back in, uh, way back in January 1965 uh, where the authors had a, uh, a two stations set up. One had the transmit antenna turn kind of slow around the azimuth. Then they had a, a the, the receiving station antenna turn much more rapidly at the receiving station. So just thinking about that, you can see that uh, uh, they could uh, see where the signal was coming from and uh, which way it had to go out of the transmitter. So Now the problem we have is 
there's really not a lot of data in that skew area. Uh, you know, there's obviously no ionosons down there. Uh, I'm not sure there's a lot of GPS receivers that we could uh, uh, use its data to infer what the ionosphere is doing either. More than likely, we'll never have that, but, but at least physics says it's possible. And I think most of us have experienced a, uh, a skewed path. Uh, uh, W4ZV uh, experienced his. Uh, uh, some guys in Colorado and guys in Florida experienced FT5ZM on 10 meters skewed. Uh, I've had skewed paths to, uh, uh, to JA in the fall when you point your antenna towards the southwest and the true great circle path is south or is northwest. So uh, skewed paths happen and I think that's kind of what's happening. Uh, I think that just about wraps it up. I'm gonna, let, me go with, let me go with uh, the summary first then I'll get back to that last slide. Uh, I, I truly believe that propagation along the terminator on the low bands is not efficient. Uh, physics says there's no magic before sunrise and uh, our model the ionosphere uh, kind of agrees with that. Now there's a lot we still don't know I'm sure about the ionosphere but uh, I think this stuff is you know, kind of basic and I think it all matches up to say that the uh, uh, propagation along the terminator is not efficient. What I really think is happening is uh, low band RF takes a shortcut across the dark ionosphere. It gets far enough away from the terminator to minimize absorption and also uh, take advantage of uh, ducting on the longer pass, on the much longer pass. But we need a skew point to kick the RF, RF off one great circle path onto another great circle path. Uh, but there are mechanisms out there to do that. Now, you don't have to change your operating habits because I think the south-southwest at your sunrise and south-southeast at your sunset axioms still apply. Uh, 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 in a, another interesting concept, <laughs> you know, there's civil twilight where I think uh, the sun is 60 degrees below the horizon. Nautical is when the sun's 12 degrees below the horizon and astronomical is when the uh, sun's 18 degrees below the horizon. Uh, those really have nothing to do with propagation. That's kind of <laughs> something we've kind of grown up with a lot. Uh, all that really matters is sunrise and sunset and that ties into the ionization process. Uh, and of course on the higher bands, uh, gray line is simply a muff issue. Uh, since uh, absorption is inversely proportional to the square of the frequency, uh, the higher the frequency, the less the absorption. So if there's a gray line path on the higher bands, it's because the sun is rising and the uh, F2 region is getting ionized and that's what's doing it. I think that's the last one. Yep, it was. Oops. Didn't get that right, did I? Now I'm going to get all the way to the See if we can get to that thanks page here. I probably could have done this easier, but hold on, we'll get there. Okay, thanks. Uh, what I tried to do is this list some of the people who have contributed to this presentation, uh, and they may not even know it. <laughs> but uh, uh, Bob NM7M, a silent key, was my mentor, and uh, he always insisted on applying physics to propagation. Boy, that was, <laughs> boy, what a thought, huh? Okay. Uh, Bill W4ZV, I mentioned him earlier on a skewed path, but uh, when he was W0ZV, he wrote a, interesting uh, article about long path and skewed pass on the lower bands and he wrote that for the SWL publication fine tunings. Uh, th that was a good article to you know start thinking about all this stuff. Of course Mike Keen one MK, uh, our personal discussions of the physics of the ionosphere. Uh, very interesting stuff and uh, there's some things that uh, uh, you know just uh, are different than what a lot of our beliefs are about. Uh, 
uh, and for II, he's one of the guys that uh, reported a skewed path to the FT5ZM on 10 meters. Uh, he also, uh, you know, we also had discussions on QSOs, his QSOs on uh, 80 meters between uh, him and uh, his friends in Florida and VK9CZ. More than likely, that was also a skewed path and not, not a, a follow the terminator path. Uh, JC and 4 is We've had some personal discussions of his 160 meter QSOs to the south Southeast Asia, uh, and uh, discussions of polarization on 160 at low latitudes. That's an interesting topic too. I'm sure there's other people that I've missed, but uh, uh, I thank all of them. So I think I'm done, uh, Ken. Okay, very good. Thank you, Carl. Okay, uh, question and answer time. Um, got a question for Carl, go ahead and send that in. Um, if you think of it, put your call sign in there too so uh, we know who you are. And uh, we'll go ahead and take some of those now. Um, first one, Carl, comes from uh, Rich Kennedy. He says, what about your research on galactic radiation as a possible reason for the skew path? Uh, <clears throat> on, uh, uh, I, I assume he's talking about galactic cosmic rays. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, mm. it we'll have to wait and uh, let him clarify that if you want to go to another question. Uh, that's probably what he's talking about. And uh, I think the the galactic cosmic rays, if they do affect propagation, do affect the ducting. Uh, I, I, I don't see any tie into uh, uh, something happening along the terminator. So... Uh, I think that's strictly just a, a ducting issue uh, of making the, the ducts more uh, amenable to to, uh, uh, to getting something up there so it doesn't have to go through the uh, absorbing region so many times and it doesn't have to uh, have a lot of ground reflections. Okay. Uh, next one comes from uh, Joe, WB9SBD, uh, uh, north of you. I think Joe's up in Wisconsin. And... Uh, was wondering about uh, from W9 land uh, in the morning on uh, 80 VK and ZL when there uh, he sees a lot of signal enhancement. Um, can you kind of speak to that as to uh, what's what's taking place there? Uh, I've not uh, been on 80 meters that much, uh, but uh, that's an interesting question, really, because uh, the one thing we know is that absorption, like a had in one of the slides, absorption is inversely proportional to the square of the frequency. So what that means is you go up in frequency, the absorption goes down. So what that says is uh, uh, that maybe the, the, uh, the, the path is really closer to the terminator than, it, uh, than on 160. And of course, as you move higher in frequency, you can get uh, you know, if the terminator is along the path, then I think that's okay. Uh, but uh, I, I haven't looked at it, Joe, so I, I really can't uh, talk about it too much. Okay, uh, next one comes from uh, KE4 Papa Tango. Uh, what are the time constants from building and decaying ionization at sunrise and sunset? Well, the uh, what I could talk in general terms is that the, uh, the of course the uh, the the uh, e, d, the D E and F regions uh, uh, very rapidly form at sunrise. Um, it it uh, let's see if I can uh, think about putting a quantitative value on that. It's probably within uh, within seconds. Now on the other side, at sunset, uh, when the ionization goes away, or when the solar radiation goes away, uh, it takes a little bit longer for the uh, ions to recombine. So that's probably an issue that needs to be you know, looked at on the sunset side. But like I said, on the sunrise side, it's uh, pretty much instantaneous. And, and I think that F2 region graph showed it. Uh, plot of uh, F2 region data and also the D region that uh, comes up pretty quick at sunrise. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, next one, uh, Bob, N6 Tango Victor. How is enhanced low band propagation 
perpendicular to the terminator. For example, the west or northwest before sunrise. Uh, how is that best explained? Uh, I think it. What I think everybody, or uh, what we, I think believe that really happens is. Uh, there's energy up in the duct and it comes out at sunrise or sunset and uh, you know the, the normal multi-hop signal is quite weak but any energy that got into the duct and comes out of course is going to be much stronger because it didn't incur uh, you know ground reflections and it didn't incur transits to the absorbing region. I think that's the best explanation for uh, sunrise and sunset enhancements but again, we don't have a lot of data on the low altitude uh, ionosphere, the dark ionosphere. You know, we see we we tend to assume it's pretty uh, homogeneous and you know just sits there and nice and quiet and everything. But uh, th there could be other things happening that maybe this sunrise and sunset enhancements uh, maybe aren't explained by uh, signals coming out of a duct. Uh, uh, that's going to be a tough one to determine because we just don't have any data. Okay, um, here's one from uh, Greg, uh, ZL3 uh, India X-ray, and he says, uh, this is more an observation than a question. Every DX season I do long path trials with the uh, British stations on top end. At both ends we have to listen towards the Caribbean, which is way off the GC and the Terminator. Um, so his observation, I don't know if you want to make any comments on that. Well, I can say that uh, you know we we probably don't pay enough interest, <laughs> attention enough attention to the equatorial ionosphere. Uh, I think uh, some paths that are related to what he's talking about. Uh, I think we see up here, uh, like on uh, the higher bands. Uh, like for me to work Europe, sometimes I have to point towards the southeast, which is towards the Caribbean, and. Uh, what it is is the equatorial ionosphere, of course, is the uh, has the highest electron densities in the world. So there's probably lots of things going on that uh, we've not paid a lot of attention to. And uh, I would think that what Greg's talking about is uh, uh, due to the equatorial ionosphere. Uh, you know, there's sporadic E going on there, too, and uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. Okay, um, I have some inf interesting information from uh, Eric, K3NA, regarding their uh, VP6DX uh, DUCI operation some years ago. I'm trying to figure out, but it's rather lengthy, I'm trying to figure out how I can cut and paste and send this over to you to take a look at. But uh, let, let's go to the next question. I'll see if I can uh, do that. Uh, from Bill, W4ZV, uh, could you repeat what the mechanisms are that cause skew from one GC path to another? Why is the skew area located in a specific geographic area of dark? Uh, that's a whoops. Wait a minute. Let me uh, get back to my. Uh, uh, there we go. I think you can see that, right, Ken? Uh, the possibilities for skew. Yeah, that's yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, hi, Bill. Um, yeah, all, all we can. <laughs> you know, we're, we're inferring a lot here. Uh, you know, what we know is that. Uh, the low band. I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty confident that low band RF uh, has to get away from the terminator. Uh, but then you got to match it up to observations that say uh, it, it appears that the signal is coming from kind of around the terminator. So that kind of limits, you know, uh, the, the great circle pass coming out of the two stations, which then uh, defines where the skew point is going to be. And of course, the skew point is really uh, uh, partly a skew area uh, since we can't pin it down that good. Um, uh, you know, the ionosphere is <laughs> very dynamic. And, uh, you know, there are uh, changes, very short term changes that we don't capture in our models of the ionosphere. And uh, in fact, we probably don't even know about some of them. <laughs> uh, so, all I can say is the, the skew areas are just based on several assumptions. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, there are a lot of assumptions when the guys were looking for the uh, Malaysia Airline 370. Uh, 
you know, they say, well, this is this must be where it came, where it ended up because of things that we saw, and that's a lot. Uh, what we're doing here with the uh, the skewed path. I don't know if I answered your question good, Bill, but uh, it's, uh, it's what I could do, I guess. <laughs> okay, um, I think this next one is more of an observation uh, from Robert. I'll pass this on to you if you've got any comments. Great, if not, then we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Meteor-induced okay. sporadic E would answer all the uh, inefficiency of the terminator with regards to the uh, Helian radiant about the sun as it rises and sets. Um, Davies, 1990, says night uh, MF propagation comes from the E region with the ever-present sporadic E, the probable cause. Yeah, that's a very interesting subject. Uh, you know, the Earth is <laughs> Earth is just surrounded by meteor uh, debris. And, uh, uh, of course, we can communicate very, very via meteor uh, but it's a scatter mode, so I suspect that uh, meteor scatter is limited to one hop. But when you, you know, the, the other process, uh, when all these this meteor debris gets assembled into very thin layers at E region altitudes, of course, then everything uh, kind of opens up. Um, I, um, you know, the. My belief is that if you can see, if you can see uh, uh, sporadic E on an ionosan, then it should be uh, good for for uh, for communications. Uh, you don't see it that much, and maybe we just don't look for it that much. But I believe that uh, uh, meteors probably have an effect on our propagation. But you gotta make sure you understand that. Uh, there's meteor scatter, then there's uh, sporadic E, which is all that debris assembled somehow into very thin sheets. And uh, just a lot of variables. And uh, uh, sometimes I think uh, since meteors are everywhere, you could probably correlate it to just about anything you wanted to. That's my personal opinion. Okay. <laughs> um. I did forward the information from Eric to you. I think it's probably not going to work here because there's a lot of good information in there, and you're probably going to need a little bit of time to read it and digest it and stuff, but you two guys may want to talk or at least look at the information he's got and uh, see if it's of uh, any use to you. Uh, let's see, Lloyd, N9LB is wondering uh, what's going to happen Saturday when we have uh, two CMEs hit us. Well, the VHF guys may be very ecstatic. Uh, the rest of us, maybe not. Uh, more than likely, what's going to happen if the uh, if the if our the Earth's magnetic field uh, you know gets hit, uh, more than likely the uh, uh, F two region at uh, mid and high latitudes is going to uh, degrade, but it may also provide some enhancement at low latitudes. And like I said, uh, at VHF. Uh, it could give us some aurora openings. So, uh, depending on what your interests are, you may be happy or sad. Okay, let's see here. Um, James writes, um, I've noticed propagation enhancement on 160 just before a solar event, the flare CME, uh, arrives at Earth. Uh, how can this be explained? Okay. Um, well, there's if you really dig into the physics, uh, what we see is that the duct can be enhanced when there's a spike in the K index. Uh, that's the only uh, thought I have on that subject. Uh, it's it, it's uh, you know been reported by many stations, a lot of New England stations working Japan, when there's a, a spike in the K index that all of a sudden the JAs come up, and it sure looks like uh, if, if you model the ionosphere and input uh, you know, what a CME does to the Earth's magnetic field, you'll see that the duct in the dark ionosphere can be uh, get a lot better and it's more conducive for ducting, which would, uh, you know, you'd think it provide better propagation. Uh, 
that's about the only thing I could say uh, on the spur of the moment. Okay, very good. Uh, there are a few other questions here, uh, Carl. I think what I'm going to suggest, uh, since we're uh, up against uh, coming up against the top of the hour, is uh, you know uh, people uh, contact you directly, and uh, I'm sure you'd be happy to answer that. And I think your uh, email is readily available, or if it uh, maybe it was in the presentation somewhere. So uh, with that, Carl, uh, anything else you want to add before we uh, wrap things up here? No, just thanks for everybody showing up. I hope I've uh, uh, Sparks some interest into understanding, uh, you know, what's going on up there a little bit better, and uh, apply some physics, and maybe you'll be surprised at uh, some of the results. It's, it's a fascinating subject, uh, and all I can say is read, read, read as much as you can, and uh, uh, maybe you'll uh, have some epiphanies. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it is an interesting topic, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time to pull this all together and to uh, come here and, and uh, present it for us. And to those uh, that have some questions hanging out there, I, I do apologize, uh, but uh, please uh, go ahead and contact Carl directly. I know he'd be uh, happy to uh, talk to you about that. So with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap things up then. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, we'll look for you next time. So from Baltimore, Maryland, where I am tonight, uh, thank you once again, everyone. Uh, have a yeah, great day. Have a great evening, uh, morning, wherever you are, 73s. Bye-bye.